Tommy! Tommy, can you hear me? It's Simon Redden. I imagine I've got about an hour of power on this kit, and then the very tiny remainder of my life is going to be spent in the bloody Stone Age. <laughs> there you are. Yes, I can hear you, dear boy. Very well, then. An oral history of how we all died. Maybe the evolved cockroach people would like it in a couple of billion years. Now do excuse me if I ramble. It's been a trying few days. And I'm about to light up a rather large marijuana cigarette I looted from the corpse of one of my staff. Remember in the Old Testament when Moses kept disappearing off up that mountain because God wanted to chat? And Moses' people got so angry about not having a constant representative of divinity, by which I mean old Moses, that they built their own god instead? You remember some bastard hacked together a golden cow and said, Okay, this is our god now and everything will be fine? That's how we work. The whole of religious history is about us trying to build amazing creatures that will save the world. So, that worked out all right, then. Some say we're actually hardwired for religion. We look for something to worship. Years ago, I read this interview with the author Whitley Strieber. And at the end of the interview, he rattles off all the religions he'd been part of or participated in to that point in his life. Including having experimented with worshipping the Earth. <laughs> a few years later, he began writing alleged non-fiction books about great and powerful creatures who came down from the heavens to essentially take over his life. That's us. They're hardwired for the need to fashion gods. Great invisible space, that is, that will descend from some place beyond the sky to tell us what to do and make everything nice. Messiahs dressed in human form that will save us all. Ah, that's rather nice, you know. Anyway, that's all the great superhuman projects of the 20th century were, Tommy. Oh, we tarted them up with rhetoric about arms races and weapons gaps and projecting force, but really... And you must understand, Tommy, that we British were the first to make one. What do you... <laughs> oh, no, 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 we were way ahead of you, Yanks. This was long before you got your hands on Jerry Craven. You see, you had poor old Von Braun writing papers and plans for donkeys years, but you never let him build any rockets. We, on the other hand, had M-16 photographing all Von Braun's work and bringing it home to Blighty. In 1955, Tommy, we had a working space vehicle with a nuclear engine, test fired in some remote rural location that strangely produced a great many children with fins and flippers. Now consider, what are the conditions in which a human transforms into or gains the aspect of Something more than human. That's right, you don't know. Nobody does. My point. Space itself was as alien and transformative an environment as we could imagine. So yes, in 1955, firing a crew out into deep interplanetary volume and leaving them there for a while to see what happened seemed like as good a method as any. We had no interest in public involvement in what came to be called the space race, you see. Britain was a rather secretive place back then. We liked the idea of doing this without anyone Seven, being the wiser. Six, five, four, three, two, one. Our jet technology back then was so good that we didn't even have to light the orbital stage until 60,000 feet or so. We were stealthy, yes.
And we'd had a superhuman project in place since, uh, 47 or so. Project Lunasa. Named for the Irish holiday when the god Lu declared a wake for his dead mother and a feast for the task that killed her. Clearing the plain of Bragg for planting. After the war, the plains of Europe were certainly well cleared, Tommy old boy. The crew? Two men and one woman for the sake of... Variety, covering our bases, a random stab in the dark. <laughs> Out there for seven days, on a looping trajectory taking them an eighth of the way to Mars, in a vessel with, shall we say, non-maximal shielding, just to see what might happen to them out there in the unknowable heavens. They arrived home some three weeks later. On a remote Norfolk beach. I say they, which is uh, technically correct. Our expectations were both confounded and exceeded. Something had indeed gotten through the shielding, but it wasn't cosmic rays or unknown space radiation. There are... Uh, Things out in space, Tommy, just waiting to bond with the human form. Possibly even waiting to uh, complete us. Mushroom spores are capable of surviving in space, you know. Our International Space Station even had a mushroom infestation a few years back. We had a bunker under what was then called the Windscale Nuclear Power Station cleared for our use. And we bent our attention to understanding what we had made. Our superhuman. Morrigan Lugus, it was named. The names of two ancient Celtic three-headed deities. All three of our astronauts. Fused together with alien mycological mass. Sometimes it spoke using sound. Empty is my hand. Sometimes it would communicate by emitting radio signals. On other occasions, it would eject spores, a four-phosphorylated indol full of digital code. And the Lunasa team's response to this creature in their midst was instant and profound. They began to worship and to pray and to masturbate with an entranced and furious intensity. One poor old man found new strength, such was his devotion, and tore his own todger entirely off. Mushrooms began growing on it, almost immediately. For sixty years, the chief function of Floor Security was to prevent maddened scientists from attempting to have sex with Morrigan Lucas. They'd always get their bell in stuck in the mushroomy bits, you see. Morrigan Lucas was a terribly laid-back deity, to be honest. It doesn't take a genius, either, to realize that mushrooms only grow on dead things. But it could think. My god, it could think. Sometimes I think it was a mycological computer on a meat substrate. 
Strangely, there was never any thought of deploying it as a weapon. Something about it, uh, uh, not sacred as such, but one could certainly never have conceived of placing it in harm's way, let alone asking it to wage war. One simply wished to, uh, breathe it in. Or have a good hard wank, obviously. Morrigan Lugus was the first. And the last. Well, that's where the real trouble started, isn't it? Krishna. The bloody Indians, of all people. Somehow running a superhuman development project for twenty years. Astonishing foresight, really. The rest of the world was still breathing out after the Cold War. But the Indians were looking ahead to crises within the first ten years of the 21st century. Mind you, India did have some unique pressures. Like fitting all its people somewhere and not choking on its own waste products. A thousand Indian children per day died from sickness related to the pollution in the River Ganges alone. It's fascinating to me that they made this incredible sustained effort to build their own salvation. The blue skin, according to the documentation that was stolen, came from some foul up in the genetic sequencing. <laughs> I don't believe a word of it. But you know, the actual cloning had been done 18 years earlier, long before Dolly the Sheep. Oh, you have to give them credit for having a live subject at all. Even more fascinating to me was their generation of a rudimentary artificial intelligence. Horribly crippled, of course, an idiot savant machine sentience. Oh, you know the paradigm, Tommy. An artificial intelligence, or intelligent agent, is a system that perceives its environment and takes actions which maximize its chances of success. Now imagine infesting an optimized human clone with that agent in the fervent prayer that the result will be a superhuman intent on saving the environment to prolong its own life. I mean, assuming that selfishness tends to win out over altruism, orders. And the fabbing machines, my god. Allowing the AI to design and fabricate technological enhancements for its human mount. Mind you, I say mount. There's a lot of evidence that Krishna was a fused personality, man and machine. Did you know, Tommy, that according to the Bhagavata Purana, Krishna was born without a sexual union, by mental transmission from the mind of Vasudeva into the womb of Devaki? Krishna, son, eighth and most beloved avatar of Vishnu, didn't you ever... They were rebuilding their most treasured manifestation of God on Earth. A cloned, designed body, infected with tailored bacteria that excrete metal, controllable by the AI net so that it could grow its own circuitry. And he arose, taking in as much information as the world had. Mahashi Mahesh Yogi celebrates Krishna. Totality celebrates totality. What is totality? Totality means I am abstract, I am concrete. One and many, point and infinity. And the dawn of it in the awareness of the human being is the awareness of totality. He spoke to them for days. They'd filled the AI net with all their scripture, of course. But Krishna was saying things that had never been written. It was quite beautiful, I've been told. He had them all in floods of tears for days, dispensing the most perfect wisdom imaginable. Mahashi says that love is the delicate impulse of totality and that totality of life is associated with the Almighty God. And he went to work to save India. Oh, excuse me a moment, I'm suddenly terribly hungry. I should make the most of this, really, shouldn't I? Now, from what we could discover, 
Krishna had in fact been successfully imprinted with the desire to save India. The one question no one asked themselves was, how exactly would he do that? India is a wonderful place, you understand. Nothing against it myself. Moral was also fucking filthy. <clears throat> and massively overpopulated. People sat in the Ganges, for God's sake. I think perhaps you might want to clean up my language. <clears throat> I'm a little bit stunned. And I don't think posterity should be subjected to the sort of words I learned from soldiers. I, I actually edit out that bit about me learning things from soldiers, too. As I was saying, Krishna decided that the first stages in saving India were to take some pressure off the population, get rid of some old infrastructure, and clean the Ganges. It didn't take long for it to get out. It took a little longer for people to grasp what was really happening, at which point I imagine everyone in the world got on the phone to Pakistan. Not that it could ever have done any good. Pakistan has long been a hollow state run by a handful of desperate murderers surrounded by Taliban sympathizers and terrified of everything. And possessing around 200 nuclear warheads spiked with tritium to boost yields into the 500 kiloton range. That's 33 Hiroshimas. All of which they launched at India. Suicide, of course. Life in Pakistan would have been untenable next to the radioactive lava pit they intended to reduce India to. Desperate. Something awful was loose. Terrified. I can't imagine what it would have been like in their command center. When the missiles turned back on themselves. This was, in fact, the hard swallow for the rest of the world. The understanding that a superhuman, by definition, does not think like us. And certainly does not act like us. Reportage from the border indicated that some people were actually cut in half when the war went up. A wall ten miles high, wrapping exactly to the border of Pakistan all the way around it. Today, we still haven't boiled Krishna's wall down to less than four or five good theories. All we know for certain is that Pakistan was fenced in when her 200 nukes came home. And that the wall somehow processed out all the radiation. But it was a wall, not a box. And those millions of tons of pulverized dirt and building and human and animal and plant all funneled straight up into the atmosphere. Nuclear winter. On one side, Mahashi explains, Krishna means black. Black means nothingness. On the other side, everything else is a manifestation of this nothingness. Krishna didn't especially care. The planet could stand to cool down, and he had other work to be getting on with. The re-engineering of India. But for everyone else... Well, you'll know what it was like, Tommy. And our eventual audience will have access to better records about Fimble Winter. I was the one who attached that term to the long winter, did you know? That position paper that got leaked, I wrote it. Thimble winter. Three winters without a summer. The immediate presage to Ragnarok, the final destiny of the gods. Hence, it all kicked off. Iran actually never meant to use theirs. They were genuinely attempting to construct an angel. Their superhuman, named Malakal Maut, was constructed on the scriptural understanding that such a creature could not, in the earthly order of things, have free will. 
and therefore would attain a direct connection to the mind of God. Because this was what passed for logic in the 20th century. I mean, perfect example. Somali Puntland, a pirate state, you remember. Do you know where the word Rastafari comes from? From Ras, an Ethiopian title equivalent to Duke, and Tafari Makonnen, a pre-coronation name of Haile Selassie I. A bizarre confluence of Puntland pieces of eight Korean scientists with things to prove, and some remarkably determined Rastafarian engineers. Ras literally means head, you know. I believe not even you Yanks were aware that in the depths of Puntland, Haile Selassie was being fitted for a body more suitable to his status as Rastafarian messiah. You were a little busy at the time, you Americans. Off to your Sonoran desert, where you kept the greatest of all American secrets. Off to commune with your super god. Oh, yes, we knew all about Undertown, Tommy. We knew what you had to do to keep your messiah calm. We knew entirely too much about Jerry Craven. We always knew he'd be the death of us. I always wanted to fight crime. Step and with the girls behind me.